All right, good afternoon and welcome back to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This afternoon we are going to pick up where we left off last week with the Transportation Committee. We were unable to hear from all of the Agency of Natural Resources witnesses. We're grateful that Marion Waltz, the Resilience and Adaptation Coordinator with ANR, could join us again today. Sorry for the delay and welcome. Oh, um, we are muted, so we Oh, you know, thanks. I thought I did that. Thanks. Um, try that again. Welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. Um, we are picking up where we left off last week with the Agency of Trans Transportation testimony from the that we were. Excuse me. Wow, I did a good job when we were muted. Um, <laughs> nailed it. Nailed it. Um, third time's a charm. We're, we are welcoming with us Marion Woltz, the Resilience and Adaptation Coordinator for the Agency of Natural Resources, who we were unable to hear from last week with, when we had our joint hearing with Transportation Committee. Welcome, Ms. Waltz. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for having us back. I appreciate being with you here this afternoon. As Mr. Feldman said, my name is Marion Waltz, and I'm the Resilience and Adaptation Coordinator at ANR's Climate Action Office. Here to share with you today some of the work we're doing in the Climate Action Office as it relates to building resilience to climate change impacts for Vermont and our communities. My right, slides so with Chris here. So, as you all are well aware, the Global Warming Solutions Act was enacted in September of 2020, and it established the Vermont Climate Council and charged it with writing a climate action plan that among other requirements must identify strategies that build resilience to prepare the state's communities infrastructure and economy to adapt to the current and anticipated effects of climate change. That climate action plan was adopted in December of 2021 and includes recommendations to reduce emissions, build resilience and adaptation and sequester carbon. The CAP also included a recommendation to establish a body within the executive branch to ensure coordinated climate action across state government. About six months after the climate action plan was adopted, a climate action office was established with the FY23 budget charged with working collaboratively within and outside ANR to see climate vision and to lead and coordinate and track climate action. The Climate Action Office has staff with expertise in greenhouse gas mitigation, adaptation and resilience, carbon sequestration, uh, communications and data analysis. But we're setting up a system to monitor and track climate work across uh, state agencies. We're establishing public access to and understanding of climate action and are working very closely with the Environmental Justice Unit at ANR, which supports the implementation of Act 154 to ensure that we're centering frontline and impacted communities and all of the work we're doing to address climate change. As the Climate Action Office was established to support a state vision for climate action, an interagency advisory board was also established to provide a space for proactive coordination on climate action across state government. This interagency advisory board, or IAAB, as you'll hear me say, includes representation from the Public Service Department, Agency of Transportation, Agency of Natural Resources, Vermont Emergency Management with Stephanie Smith, Agency of Agriculture, Buildings and General Services, Human Services, Commerce and Community Development, as well as the Vermont State Climatologist who you heard from at your last uh, joint testimony with the transportation. How many people are in the, how many staff are in the climate office? We currently have one, two, three, four, five, six, and we'll be soon hiring. So I mentioned we have uh, three folks that are really focused on greenhouse gas mitigation. Um, myself with Adaptation and Resilience, we have a communications and community engagement coordinator, and we'll be soon hiring someone with a focus on carbon sequestration and natural working lands. And then all led by Jane Lazorczyk, who will be here soon. <laughs> Your pretend friend. <laughs> so there will be eventually be a staff of seven. We're at six right now. Um, so specific to resilience and adaptation, which is really the focus of my work, I'll be sharing with you all today the ongoing and planned work in the Climate Action Office as it relates to resilience and adaptation coordination um, across state government and, and with partners within and outside a &R. I'll speak to technical analysis and tools in just a moment and get into a bit more detail on the work we're doing there. In the strategy and program development space, we're really focused on resilience strategies and programs that are supporting work across state government on incorporating a climate resilience lens into existing work. I think you all have heard from folks and will continue to hear. There's a lot of work happening on adaptation and resilience <coughs> across agencies within state government. This isn't a new space. And the Climate Action Office is really providing that platform to help coordinate that work and speak to 
um, how we pull that into sort of our day-to-day -day conversations about the impacts of climate change on all of our work. A few examples of the strategy and program development. Um, we uh, um, granted to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development additional funds to add a focus to their designation and evaluation reform study um, to add capacity to dig further into climate resilience research, targeted engagement, and additional recommendations specifically around climate solutions in our downtown areas. ACCD or the Department of Housing and Community Development will be, I believe, has come out with the report, the designated evaluation <laughs> reform report um, just last week, I believe, and the, the report for the climate recommendations will be coming out at the end of January. So we're looking forward to to partnering with ACCD on that and sharing that report that really includes recommendations of how to build climate resilient strategies into the designation programs. Excuse me, can you say one more time, you asked them to add something to their other designation study and just one more summary of what you asked them to do. Yeah, so we, um, at following the flooding in July, ACCD had already taken on and had under contract uh, Smart Growth America to do this evaluation of the designation programs, right, that are run out of the Department of Housing and Community Development. There was a small focus within that an initial scope of work on climate resilience and really better incorporate actions and supports for communities that are uh, in the designation program or interested in, in being in the designation program for climate resilience. But acknowledging sort of the impacts of flooding, there was interest in sort of expanding that scope of work. And so we granted funds um, from our climate action budget to the DHCD to sort of expand that scope of work within their existing contract with Smart Growth America. And so what it looked like was pulling in additional uh, expertise in climate resilience, um, sort of in compact settlements and, and with Smart Growth America, they did an analysis or, or really a, a look at both within state programs and external to state programs, best practices on incorporating climate resilience into supporting downtown and economic community development centers. Um, and are going to be producing, again, at the end of January, sort of an addendum to that um, designation reform study that really speaks to how recommendations for incorporating climate resilience into the designation programs. Um, as I noted earlier, the Climate Action Office is also building a tool to measure and track climate action. Building that tool establishes, includes also establishing metrics for climate resilience, and we're, in, we're uh, embarking on that process with partners within the agency interagency advisory board, and then specifically Vermont Emergency Management, Public Service Department, Agency of Transportation, and uh, DEC, to ensure we both know what we can track and ensure that we're building this tool, um, thinking about long-term what we should be tracking to better understand outcomes and impacts of our work on building climate resilience. So that's the measuring and assessing progress tool that the Climate Action Office is, is currently working through um, the RFP and responses to the RFP. And a big component of that will be um, establishing a process and building metrics for climate resilience so we can get a better sense of, of um, our work in the climate resilience space and really the impacts that's having on, on communities. We're also coordinating closely with Vermont Emergency Management with Stephanie here on how the Climate Action Plan and the State Hazard Mitigation Plan can better iterate off each other when it comes to climate resilience with the goal of using those plans and others to articulate a statewide vision for resilience as well as being able to iterate off the actions needed to implement that vision across multiple planning efforts. So those are ongoing conversations we're having to really speak to how can the state hazard mitigation plan and the climate action plan that both have, have focuses on uh, climate resilience, better iterate off each other and build off each other um, for the actions that are included there. You all may have also seen the recent announcement from the governor and the treasurer's office to build a resilience implementation strategy. The Climate Action Office will be partnering in that effort with the Treasurer's Office and the Governor's Office. We began meeting with them just this week to start to discuss the framework to develop that strategy, and much of it will build off existing work planned uh, within the Climate Action Office. And then broadly in the communication space, the Climate Action Office is working on communication support for climate action, both within ANR and external, thinking about how we communicate out the results of the work we're doing to track climate work and state government, um, as well as communicate out program coordination for various audiences, audiences and partners. So taking a step back, uh, you all heard from ANR colleagues um, at the uh, testimony last week, as well as Dr. Dupingi Giroux, the state climatologist, about the impacts of the July flooding, what we've learned and how agencies uh, are, agency programs are really addressing these gaps. The events from this summer, early droughts, poor air quality due to wildfires, frost falling on seasonably warm weather, and the flooding from the summer and winter 
all heighten the importance and urgency of cross-sector and cross-agency coordination to support communities and people who are feeling the impacts of climate change every day. In conversations and stakeholder engagement on tools that I'll get to in just a moment, what we've been hearing as needed supports is really more <laughs> urgent following all of the events of this summer and winter. I will note the Climate Action Office wasn't involved in immediate flood response or recovery um, that really lasted through September, but our office and the Interagency Advisory Board with respect to climate resilience play a role in coordinating efforts um, to really think about how we enhance our program delivery um, for folks um, uh, regarding disasters exacerbated by climate change. So getting to those tools I, I said I was going to get to, um, much of my focus over the last year has been to develop tools and to build climate resilience into the lexicon of day-to-day -day municipal planning and project implementation. So it's easier for communities um, across the state to adapt to climate change and build that into their existing work. I have a slide each for two tools, um, would welcome separate conversations to get into more detail on them as I know we don't have a whole lot of time today. Um, so these will remain at a fairly high level, but happy to, to answer questions or come back at another time. So the first tool you'll see a mock-up on the screen here is what we're calling the Municipal Climate Toolkit. It's a key recommendation that comes from the Global Warming Solutions Act requirement to recommend tools for municipalities to assess their climate resilience. This toolkit's being developed and led with ANR through a partnership with the Vermont Climate Council. The goal of this toolkit is to provide a centralized hub for information relevant for designing and implementing climate action measures or strategies, as well as information on financial resources and technical assistance for municipalities. <clears throat> We're intending it to be a one-stop shop or perhaps two-stop shop for municipalities looking to incorporate climate change into their municipal planning and processes. Currently, tools and resources and technical assistance that address various aspects of climate change exist across state government, but there's not one location that links all those resources together and provides an avenue for folks to ultimately see how their work um, fits into this broader lens of climate change action. So the mock-up here on the screen um, shows a, a sample of, of um, what resources uh, could look like. We're intending to have them grouped both by topic area and resource type. Each topic area will include an overview of the topic and how that relates to and is impacted by climate change. Um, we've been working on this toolkit for a while. We're having some delays due to IT issues, but hope to roll it out later this spring. I'm so excited to share that with municipalities and really think about how we can continue to build out this toolkit um, to, to better connect to you know, grants, uh, data, financial resources, and case studies for communities um, to incorporate climate change into their work. We have a question from Representative Stebbins. Hi, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, are you coordinating with the RPCs or with BAFTA on this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we've had um, extensive stakeholder engagement with municipalities and RPCs on the toolkit okay. mm -hmm. and intend to, and I'll get to it with sort of the next tool and resource, but are really thinking about how we build out a partnership, okay. um, sort of codified partnership with RPCs to help roll out a lot of these resources. Yeah. Because it's definitely not a one shop, one stop shop if you don't have all there. <coughs> yeah. Great. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the next tool, again, just one slide for each, um, uh, but happy to come back and speak to it in more detail. Um, this uh, is a resource we also expect to have completed later this spring uh, that we're calling the Municipal Vulnerability Index Tool. This is also a requirement of the Global Warming Solutions Act, and again, is being developed in partnership with the Climate Council. Mm -hmm. The Municipal Vulnerability Index, or MVI, is, will be a user-guided geospatial mapping tool intended to help municipalities understand and explore their vulnerabilities to climate change across a range of social, economic, and biophysical factors. The MVI will help Vermont communities identify where climate change is placing pressures on various sectors and will help inform planning priorities uh, and work on hazard mitigation plans, local energy plans, emergency response plans, et cetera. What you see on the slide here, the five bullets, are domains or groupings of potential vulnerability indicators that will be displayed again in a geospatial form in this mapping tool. Um, we're using Vermont specific data um, where possible and are aligning with other existing tools like the Social Vulnerability Index, BioFinder, the Flood Ready Atlas, and others. We will be also including geospatial data on climate hazards um, where we have it and are aligning those hazards in the tool with the hazards that are identified in the State Hazard Mitigation Plan. The MVI will use climate hazard data where we have it from local data sets and those with climate projections whenever possible. And then we will also, of course, be incorporating regional and national data sets as needed. 
Vermont's not alone in lacking authoritative sort of peer reviewed climate, uh, local and state data for climate projections, particularly in a geospatial form. So we are building this tool with a mind towards future incorporation of climate projections as they become more readily available. So again, this is intended to be sort of a flexible user guided approach. If folks are familiar with using BioFinder where you can turn layers on and off and sort of see overlays of particular factors, that will be what this will, tool will look like. It's not gonna spit out a single vulnerability score, but will rather provide a way for municipalities and other partners to see um, factors in the social space, <laughs> built in physical environment, natural hazards, and overlays um, with, um, excuse me, natural environment and overlays with natural hazards where we have it. And we'll also include a system of flagging um, so that we can better indicate the presence and scale of vulnerability for particular factors that will be in this tool. I just received a draft of this tool on Monday of this week. Um, we'll be beta testing the tool with a handful of municipalities, as well as our task group made up of members of the Vermont Climate Council later this month, with, the, again, the intent to have the tool ready to go uh, uh, in April of this year. To your question, Rep. Stevens, on uh, working with regional planning commissions, we are also hoping and working to partner with our PCs to help us train on the tool with municipalities and other local partners once complete. This will look both like trainings with municipalities and partners, as well as working with our PCs to um, develop profiles or municipal guides that will really show how the tool can be used to connect to existing planning and project implementation work that municipalities or RPCs will. I'm looking forward to that collaboration. So wrapping up, um, as I said earlier, the Climate Action Office was established to support a state vision for climate action. And there are a number of projects um, on our horizon that we see as instrumental to helping us better understand the impact of the work we're doing in state government, to better and more efficiently provide resources and technical assistance on climate resilience to municipalities and other partners, and to provide information and communication support to decision makers as we grapple with the more severe impacts of climate change on our state. I've highlighted some of the upcoming work on the slide here. Um, I don't think we have time to go through all of them, but we'll note that we see all of this work as well as our coordination with the Interagency Advisory Board as both important standalone tools or resources, but also building blocks to get to a better understanding of what it takes for our communities in our state to be more resilient to climate change. So in closing, the Climate Action, climate action Office has been around for a little over a year. We have a lot of work ahead of us with partners and are excited about providing a space um, to speak collectively about state climate resilience vision that gets us to a place of a more uh, resilient Vermont. So with that, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Do members have questions? Oh, okay. Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for coming in. Huh? Um, is would your office have already, I see planning on here as part of your office mm -hmm. uh, responsibilities. The first one on the slide, by the way. So okay. I'm wondering uh, when we talk about planning for municipalities or pinch points where we have problems, <clears throat> it's are you going to get into uh, mitigation issues or possibilities or what we can do to mitigate some of these hazard right. points or and offer suggestions or? To look at how we could mitigate some of these, and I, and I reference um, sediment removal in certain mm -hmm. areas, which we're not allowed now, or berming in certain areas, mm -hmm. or I know we're doing things with oversized culverts or mm -hmm. removing them and putting in the, the full span arch uh, bridge right. type thing. So, is, is it going to include that, or my? looking at uh, too high of a level or low of a level detail? No, it's a good question. I think, um, so a lot of that planning work that municipalities take on, which I think Stephanie will be able to speak to, happens through their writing of their local hazard mitigation plans, which really allows them to do an analysis of what hazards they're facing and then what actions they can take to mitigate the impacts of those hazards as you're speaking to. And that's really that planning that happens at a local level. I think the Climate Action Office, our role particularly in the adaptation space is helping to coordinate within state governments with the work that's already happening and provide those resources to our other partners. I will say in planning, um, uh, there's again, the work that municipalities do with local hazard mitigation planning, our, uh, some municipalities also take on energy planning work. Um, there's sort of a lot of planning that happens in the municipal space and the regional space as well. And you'll see on the slide here, one of the things we're working on is thinking about a, providing a framework or sort of a guide for communities to think through what would a climate action plan look like, understanding the work we're already doing in the hazard mitigation, emergency management, energy planning space, and sort of connecting those pieces into 
a climate planning framework. So that's a, a sort of a space where we're looking to provide some additional assistance. It's not specifically in the like, you know, speaking to development of berms or um, sediment review. Right, but I think our connection and our work with the Rivers Program at ANR, again, Stephanie's office at BEM, um, provides that connection and framework for, for mm -hmm. communities to have those conversations and be able to connect with technical assistance partners who really have that expertise. Thank you. Yeah. So your office have an inventory of all of the programs for climate adaptation and resilience and, and <clears throat> not in your department, but we have a lot of bills trying to address problems and understanding what's already happening that really doesn't need to be reinvented would be incredibly helpful. And so do you maintain that? We um, <clears throat> don't have a full picture of that, but I will say um, prior to the Climate Council being set up, there was a, an inventory <clears throat> of what programs exist across state government for greenhouse gas mitigation and climate adaptation resilience. And that's I don't know if it's an extensive list, but it's a good starting point to get a sense of um, where there are programs and sort of, um, it's just an Excel document, but programs that address <laughs> climate adaptation <laughs> resilience. The second part to, to answer your question is um, that analysis of where programs exist within state government for climate adaptation and resilience, and also an understanding of where there are gaps is something mm -hmm. we're really interested in and are pursuing a sort of a future work project. And we'll actually connect closely with the uh, um, resilience implementation strategy that the governor and treasurer's, treasurer's office just announced recently um, is really doing an, an audit, might not be the right word, but an analysis of existing state programs um, and projects and, and where there's overlap and gaps in the adaptation and resilience space. So um, sort of two parts to your question. One, it's not something we currently maintain, but are interested in doing soon. Um, but there was a list created prior to the Climate Council being stood up that we could share as a resource. That'd be great if you could send us that. Um, and then it strikes me that perhaps it, is it in the climate action plan and inventory of these programs? Uh, would Not be. directly in the plan. No, it was uh, created for the council to sort of reference and the subcommittee mm -hmm. to reference as they developed actions in the climate action plan, but it's not included in the plan currently. Thanks. And thanks for in advance for sending that. And thank you again for your presentation. Yeah. <laughs> we will shift gears. Um, and welcome Stephanie Smith from Vermont Emergency Management. Thank you all so much for having us back. I'm sorry we got cut off at the last meeting, but I appreciate the, the opportunity to come back. Let me just make this full screen. All right, so hi, I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the State Hazard Mitigation Officer at Vermont Emergency Management. So I manage our hazard mitigation program with the goal of making Vermont safer and more resilient in the face of climate change and natural hazards. Uh, so I know this session was posed as the Agency of Natural Resources and what they're doing, um, but incredibly grateful to Secretary Moore for letting me be a part of that party because I work incredibly closely with everyone you heard from last week and with Marion um, as, as we advance this work. We can't do it without this entire group. So working, <clears throat> all working very collabor collaboratively together, which has been great. So I'll start briefly on the planning side. Uh, within the program, we have planning and grants. I'll spend most of my time on grants, um, but wanted to tell you about the our state hazard mitigation plan, which is a document that we update every five years. Uh, and we just received approval for the 2023 plan in November. So we have a brand new version um, that was just FEMA approved. And the state hazard mitigation plan assesses all of the natural hazards that Vermont is vulnerable to, and it poses a mitigation strategy to improve resilience, reduce future risk um, across state government, and it, it cuts across state government, it includes stakeholders outside of state government. Um, so the intent really there is to, to figure out how do we create those synergies, and, and that's part of what, as Marion spoke to, trying to figure out how to make sure that's co connected with the climate action plan and that they're speaking to each other, and it's all part of the the set of, of how we propose a, a more resilient future for, 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 for Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, the state hazard mitigation plan. And on the funding side, I'll spend most of my time on this slide. Um, we, on the FEMA side, I'll focus on uh, mainly the hazard mitigation grant program here, which is this top one. So we receive an allocation under this program whenever we have a federally declared disaster in the state. So the amount available is dependent on the scale of that disaster. 
but the funding can be spent anywhere in the state. So it doesn't have to be tied to the locations that were hit. It doesn't even have to be flood related. The idea is proactive future risk reduction through this program. But to give you some context, following Tropical Storm Irene, we had about $34 million in this program. It's still a little early to know final numbers, but we're looking at probably 75 million or more uh, following the July flood. So it's by far the largest pot of this FEMA round that we've ever had. Um, and with this pot, we can do a variety of different things. So that includes property buyouts, which I'll speak a little more to in a minute, um, project, project scoping activities, which is what allows us to develop projects, uh, floodplain restoration work, infrastructure projects, such as upsizing culverts or bridges, or we've done a couple of dam removals as well, um, residential property elevations and floodproofing projects for commercial or municipal buildings. So all that's within the realm of possible here. Um, and we can also do utility resilience projects. So things that protect against ice and wind vulnerabilities it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to flooding, although that is the, the bulk of, of what we fund. <laughs> FEMA funding under this program requires a 25% local match. We have a one-time general fund allocation right now, which will allow us to cover match for property buyouts specifically. Uh, we have 5 million left in that pot, which will get us to the first 20 million worth of buyouts. Um, under this $75 million. So it gets us to about 50 properties. Uh, one other FEMA program that I'll note, so flood mitigation assistance, Swift Current is on here. Um, this is a relatively new program from FEMA. So we just got a new announcement of it last fall. Um, nationally, there's $300 million available. It's specifically for states that have recent disaster declarations. So Vermont is eligible for up to 40 million under this pot following the July flood. This is a, it's a brand new program for us. So we're, we're learning very quickly and trying to make sure we get an application so we can utilize those dollars. And the funding is specifically intended to reduce risk to the national flood insurance pool. So the requirements are a little bit more narrow here. So it's for properties that have flood insurance and they're either a repetitive loss property, a severe repetitive loss property, um, or they were considered substantially damaged within this last flood. So if they meet one of those three definitions, which are specifically defined by FEMA, um, then this pot can be used for those property buyouts of those structures, elevations, or potentially relocation projects where we're lifting up a house and moving it to a different, safer location. So the deadline for applications under this pot is May 15th, so it's, it's coming up really fast. Um, but we're starting to work with communities on getting those applications in. Uh, and then at the top of the screen here, we also have state ARPA funding, which is our program called the Flood Resilient Communities Fund. This was one of the top priorities in the 2018 State Hazard Mitigation Plan to create a program that fills gaps in what we can't fund with FEMA dollars. So it allows us to be creative. It allows us to take away some of the administrative burden for towns to try and make it easier. Um, that's That's been this plot for us. It's been a really phenomenal um, opportunity to build that program over the last few years. Uh, and the main focus there is on, we can do fund other things as well, but the focus is projects, including buyouts that are not eligible for FEMA funding. One of the main reasons properties are ineligible for FEMA funding is that they're outside of the FEMA map special flood hazard area, which is a, a line that, in, that denotes inundation risk, which is water coming up and spilling out onto a floodplain, where in Vermont, our, within the state hazard mitigation plan, that's our second ranked hazard. Our first highest ranked hazard is fluvial erosion risk which is water coming off of mountains, cutting around corners. Rob Evans spoke a little bit to this last week. Um, so really trying to capture risk in that area, which is broader than just the, the theme of that that we're looking at. So that's one of the biggest things we've been able to do through this program. And we, so the, we had about 20 million total um, from ARPA funding and we just obligated the final 3 million of this program in December. So we're currently implementing those projects um, but we don't have any additional funding to obligate under that program. And a little bit more on buyouts. So since Tropical Storm Irene, our program has completed about 170 buyouts across the state, across various funding programs. Property buyouts are voluntary for the property owner as well as the community. The community generally ends up owning the parcel following the, the buyout and they're required to maintain it as open space in perpetuity. So the idea is nothing else will be there that's vulnerable, that's gonna flood uh, in the future. The majority have been residential, but commercial properties are eligible as well. And we've done a few of those, and we have a few more that I think we'll, we'll be doing following July. 
one of the nice things about these programs is that we're able to do day before the storm values for properties that flooded during this event. So the property appraisals are based on the value as of July 9th, as though nothing had happened. Um, and then with the match funding, we're able to offer 100% of that value to property owners. Uh, and if they weren't flooded, we can also do current market appraisals. So it's not required that they have past flooding, it's required that they have flood risk. <clears throat> And directly following the July flood, one of the first things we did was to set up an intake form for property owners that were interested because we were starting to hear from people very quickly following that event. We have well over 250 responses on that form now and it's still open. Um, my team and I have been meeting with communities over the last few months to have initial conversations to start developing applications. So if we have a town that's very motivated and property owners that are motivated, we're able to start pulling those applications together um, and answering questions for towns that are, are unsure and helping them figure out a, a path forward. So, so far we've submitted a couple of applications on the FEMA side. So one for a landslide buyout in Ripton. So one of, um, when you heard from Ben DeYoung last week, he talked about the landslides and doing assessments for FEMA buyouts. One of the requirements for that program is that we have a letter from the state geologist saying that it's at imminent risk of failure. So we worked very closely on, on quite a few potential landslide buyouts following the July flood. Uh, and then we've also submitted two buyouts in Hartwick. So those, that's what's gone to FEMA so far, but we have about 10 million worth of property buyouts that we're getting ready to submit that will go to FEMA in the next month or two. So we're not waiting for the end of the funding round for the buyouts. As soon as we have applications, everything signed and in from communities, we're sending them to FEMA so that they can get into their review queue. We have a question from Representative Bob. Yep. It's just that. <clears throat> um, just to think about as we go along, because one of the challenges with the buyouts, which I think are great, and they, they're, it makes all the sense in the world, but I did have, when I was talking with one flooded homeowner group, and we had uh, Joe Broker Campbell there for the, and one of the residents leaned over to me and said, so I get 400000 then what? <laughs> so we have to be thinking about where do they go? Because that's got to be part of this equation. So I put that out there as, you know, as we yeah. think about this, but the plants are great and glad they're available. So, absolutely. And I think that's, we're hearing this time and following our rain buyouts were the, the biggest solution that we did. We did a couple of elevation projects as well, but I think we're, we're getting a lot more interest in elevating. And if it is in that inundation risk area, elevation might make sense. Um, or it's, I've been getting questions this week about relocation which is possible, but it's something we've never actually done with FEMA funding. Um, I think for properties where, it, it, I think it'll depend a lot on the structure, whether that makes sense or not. So if it's a double wide mobile home that we can lift up more easily and move or something like that, something that's manufactured um, or something on a slab, I think it that's all within the of possible as long as we have a site to put it on. So I think there are other opportunities. And then it's also why we're looking at these larger projects as well. Like are there large flood and restoration projects I'll show you a couple of examples in a minute where we've been able to do larger projects that reduce risk more broadly, and maybe that allows us to keep people in place. So yeah, it's all part of the, it's part of the set for sure. Thank you. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, what is your anticipated turnaround time dealing with schema? Yes, so I get that question a lot. Um, the, we're getting it to FEMA as quickly as we can um, because it is gonna take a little while to go through the FEMA review queue. So they, they're a little low on staff right now, but we've, we've been working with them over the last few years between Irene and now, where we have a really good application that we're putting together that speaks to what they need. And so we're trying to make it as quick, as streamlined as we can through the process, but it could easily take six months or more within FEMA review once it gets there. Thank you. And would you say that the 250 people who are registered is the demand or is the demand significantly different from that? It's a great question. I think <clears throat> it's hard to tell at this point for a couple of reasons. I think that initial list, we'll see some attrition. There will be people that they were interested or they wanted to know more, but they're not gonna end up doing it. But then once we start working in a community, we're sitting down with the town, we're talking to them, we're working with the property owners and then their neighbors are seeing, oh, this is real and this is happening. Let's, I want I'm interested now too. So I think we'll see more coming in as we start to do projects as well. So I, I think we'll see some attrition, but I think we'll see more interest as well. So it's it's hard to tell right now where we'll land, but I think I'll have a better sense in six months. And are they getting easier? You've done 170 since Irene, which well, is like 
Ray, but yeah. you have 250 now. <laughs> Yes. So one of the things that we're doing this round that we've never done before is we're implementing a state-run buyout program for communities that are interested. And everyone, every community I've talked to so far has been very interested, um, which looks like Vermont Emergency Management submitting the application to FEMA and then having a signed MOU in it with the town saying that they'll still end up owning the parcel. They'll still be required to maintain it as open space and meet those requirements, but we're going to manage the money. So that allows us to hire one entity to do all of the appraisals, which again, I'm, the significant hope is that makes it a lot faster because once we have that person hired, we get the FEMA award and we can say, go do the appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have to wait for the town to have a subgrant agreement and for the town to really go procure someone. And so I think that will take a lot of the administrative burden off of the towns and then also make it a lot faster because we'll already have someone to do the legal work lined up who can start pulling the title and developing closing documents someone lined up to do demo as soon as it's ready. So that's one way that we're trying to make it a lot easier for our towns. And I think honestly, it'll make it easier for us too, because we're right now providing a lot of customer support to our towns through that process. And if we're managing the funding, we won't need to be doing that piece. So the scale has gone up a lot, but I think we're, we're working very hard to find what are those opportunities to make it easier for everybody all around. I know you have more slides to get to, but I have, I was going to ask about uh, how, um, how, how you, are you working with the under the no staff communities? Because it can be very complicated for them. And that's great. I, I hear what you've just done for this program. Are there other ways you're able to do that to support towns that don't have any staff? Yeah, we're, we're trying to the best of our ability based on our capacity. Um, I was also talking to, Sarah Waring from USDA Rural Development yesterday, who's working on building a new technical assistance program that I'm hoping can fill some of that gap as well, um, especially for the communities that have less ability to, to, man to even contemplate managing a FEMA grant. But again, with this buyout model, they won't have to manage the grant. So then it's really meeting with the select board and making sure they are, understand and are okay with the property being vacant, um, which is another really hard conversation to have with towns, especially given the housing market and grand lists and all of that. So we're having those conversations and trying to talk them through the process. I, I have just a little bit more. Um, the other, well, under the Flood Resilient Communities Fund, I just wanted to note that we, there are a couple of buyouts that have already gone into that program for that last 3 million following July. Um, so that's buyouts in Hardwick, Marshfield, Middlebury, Wolcott, Cambridge, and Montpelier. So we're starting to, to get those projects in. Um, and then one other project type that I'll talk about, and then I'll, I wanna show you just a couple of examples. So directly following the flooding in July, one other thing that we did was submit a scoping application to FEMA. So it allows us to, this project will allow us to work with some of the hardest hit communities to develop potential projects that can lower flood elevations within their downtowns. Um, it's a collaborate, collaborative effort with the DEC Rivers team, with ACCD, with the regional planning commissions, and Two Rivers Atacuichi Regional Planning Commission is gonna manage the engineering contract for us. And they'll be partnering with the other RPCs to work in their regions. Um, so that's very exciting. It's just getting off the ground now. Um, and it includes some funding from Vermont Housing and, Community and Conservation Board to pay the RPCs to help provide that community outreach and support. So it's, I think it's probably gonna be like a two, two and a half million dollar project to start working in some of the hardest hit towns and develop develop projects that we can submit under that 75 million that I talked about. So that's, we're just at the beginning of that project, um, but looking forward to being able to tell you more about it soon. Um, and then we're also accepting scoping projects from communities. So Cambridge has already submitted one that's already gone to FEMA. Um, so communities can be, that's open for communities to be submitting projects right now to help them figure out what they should do to move forward. Um, okay, so that's all I had on the funding. But I'd love to show you a couple of examples of projects that were completed following Irene that were incredibly successful in July. So one of those is in Northfields. There's this beautiful Dog River Park in Northfield. So everything in green with a number, that's a property that was a buyout. And they were able to create this beautiful community park, do a floodplain restoration project to lower flood elevations within this neighborhood. So most of the time it's this nice asset for the community. And then in July, it filled up with floodwaters and it lowered flood elevations in the surrounding neighborhood. So this is a really successful project and we're looking to be able to do more of this type of thing um, following the July flood. 
and then a couple of large floodplain restoration projects that I'll talk about. And again, the focus here is very much on how do we give the river space where we can so we slow it down before it gets into our downtowns. So these are two projects just upstream on the whetstone of Brattleboro, um, which was, eight, these were in the black, those were senior housing facility buildings. Um, those residents were relocated. We were able to demolish those buildings, do a, another large floodplain restoration project, put in an overflow culvert, lower flood elevations in the surrounding neighborhood. And that's seven. Sorry, so that map, can you go back? Yes. So the blue is where the river flooded? The blue is where we did the restoration work. Okay. Yes. And I'll show you a picture. The river actually, this like one. they're not actually in the river. No, but they, but it was, they were in the floodway. Yes. It was a very high risk area and they, the, they were evacuated during Irene. Uh, yes. So it was really being able to move this vulnerable population. Um, and then this, this view might help. So this was the December, 2022 flood, um, which looked a lot like the December, 2023 flood that we just had. But if you see the snow line there, that's where the water was on that site. Um, and there, this building in the middle is this one is their um, office space for Brattleboro Housing Authority. But the, the homes were all around here. So I was able to access that floodplain, nothing flooded. Um, and it lowered flood elevations for the surrounding neighborhoods. Representative Stebbins, then Smith. So one of my concerns always is that um, we do these projects where we resize a culvert um, and it's not to like the thousand year storm, it's to like the 250 year storm or the 500 year storm. And it's it's like the thousand year storm is gonna be here soon. It's not gonna be a thousand years. What, like yeah. what storm evaluation are you putting these on? Because to, to be honest, like the, the snow line doesn't look that far from the building that's still there. From the structure, yeah, it is a, it's a little bit higher, thankfully, but you're, you're absolutely right. And I think part of, and I talk with the Rivers team about this a lot too, and Rob Evans, who you guys spoke with last week, it's all of these projects, like looking at these two large restorations, it's, those are one piece of this full set. And as water gets higher, we're gonna to need to find even more opportunities. So right. it's not removing flood risk, it's lowering the elevation a little bit. So it's all, it's, it's, each one of these is incremental progress, but as we see more rain coming in, it's, we're gonna to have to keep doing more and more. So that's, that's part of how, we're, that's absolutely part of how we're thinking about it. But are you basing it on, you know, what, what flood year for a lot of those projects? Yeah, it, on the FEMA side, there it it depends. It depends on the local regulations. It depends if it's a state building, they'd be required to meet the the DEC requirements, which are like if it's an elevation, it's two foot above base flood elevation, um, which is they're encouraging communities to to go that high. So it's going to depend on the project. I don't I don't remember the elevations on this one exactly. Yeah. Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... What are your thoughts on dredging? So I would point you back to Rob Evans, who we spoke with, um, who you guys spoke with last week to speak to that in more detail. Um, my understanding from talking to him many times is that it, it tends to exacerbate the problem further on. Um, so making the river deeper makes it faster and it increases erosion around the It makes the it faster to get out. So. It, and it increases erosion, which is again, that's that erosion risk is our biggest hazard in the state, not the inundation risk. So it's the, the forces that undercut a bank and then a house falls into the river, like we saw during Tropical Storm Irene. So it's trying to prevent that sort of dynamic where we're destabilizing a river and increasing erosion risk. I wish you hadn't talked to him, but I'd like to hear your opinion. Yeah. Well, we, we work very closely. And we I, have I can see that. All part of the... <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, and this is another one. So you can see this actually shows the building being a, a little bit higher, at least. Um, and then the whetstone is the other one. And then the last, I think this is the last project I had on here. Oh, there might be one more. Um, is this Brandon overflow culvert. So this Brandon is a community that was hit very heavily during Irene. And the floodwaters from the Neshobe, they're on the top here. You can see where they're coming down. And it went straight through downtown. Now this overflow culvert gives the river the opportunity to go underneath the community instead of over it. So most of the time it's empty. There's no water in there. But during a high flow event, it gives the river a little bit space. It's like a pressure release to give the river somewhere else to go. This one's been successful many times since they installed it. 
And then the last one, this is a Cambridge a project we did in Cambridge to upsize the trail bridge. So you can see the really tiny trail bridge at the beginning of this and how incised it is in the river. Uh, we were able to put in this much larger span, restore floodplain underneath, and again, give the river space, slow it down um, before it gets into our communities. And that's all I had for you guys, but I'd be happy to answer any further questions. Thank you for your presentation. Representative Stemmons. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the picture two pictures ago uh, in Brandon, so that, that's normally dry. So there's, yes. no, there's no impact to like um, any of the various critters or species that would normally be in the, going up and down the stream. Yeah, so that's exactly. So it's not okay. impacting so it's the river, really it's just giving it an extra space if it needs it. Fascinating. Yeah, so the water comes down here, and this is the top corner in this picture. Yeah. It's the top corner, so it's, it usually goes around the community this way. But in Irene, it went straight. This is the downtown. It went straight through. Um, so it gives it that opportunity instead of, huh. naturally, the river's not going to want to go around something. If it's too high, it's going to just want to plow through. So this gives it the, the space to do that. We'll put it to shop right down the middle of the road. It's really cool stuff. That, just, just a question on that on that picture right here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is that was that armored? Um, to, to direct the water to go through there. There's actually grade control there. There's actually yeah. be, there's bedrock adjacent and nearby. <laughs> so it, and I don't have the downstream photo. Actually, kind of worked on part of this. Both of those projects um, previously, the Brattleboro and then. This one. Uh, but it's a ledge where you can natural. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, members, we will take a, about a, a five minute break and be back at 150 with the uh, Natural Resources Board. We are <laughs> we're reconvening our meeting and welcoming um, the Natural Resources Board, Sabina Haskell and Peter Gill, uh, to present their off session PAC 250 report. Oops. Welcome back. Thank you, Chair Sheldon. And again, I am Savannah yeah. Haskell. I'm with the chair of the Natural Resources Board. And with me today is Pete Gill, our executive director. Um, and we had a great summer doing this report. And I, I'm, I, it was a good summer. It was really a lot of work. And we got it done. And it feels good. Um, I've had conversations with some of you in the committee. But what we were going to do was go ahead and do an overview. And then please just jump in with questions, comments, et cetera, et cetera. OK. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, are we apologies. I think I uh, in the room. unclicked the link. Yeah. I was asking about bringing, sending things to third party, so I canceled that, and then it kicked me out. Oh, uh, yeah, just say yes. I'll, I'll say yes. Go to third parties. Got it. Let me know when you're ready. OK. I'll also, well, I won't say it quite yet. I'll say it in a minute. We got a little bit of that. Okay, how's that look from that Great. So, are we good to begin? Okay, okay. thank you. Um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, part of Act 182 of 2023 directed the Natural Resources Board. Sorry. That's okay. It's one of our own members. <laughs> <laughs> to do a legislative study, necessary updates to the Act 250 program. There are also two other studies that are very much integrated into this effort, and that's the designation study, designation 2050 study, and the, um, I never say it right, VAP does, <laughs> future land use mapping study, as well as the, the municipal delegation study, but we won't touch on that one so much today. But so just this morning, we heard from two of those three. We haven't heard the um, designation one yet, but we did hear delegation and future land use map. Oh, great. Great. Excellent. OK. And I wanted to be here, but we were downstairs. Yeah. So I'm, I hope it went well. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, moving on uh, to our Act 250 background, which is going to 
I can breeze through this since you all know it, but it's our land use uh, law that was developed, uh, passed in 1970. Uh, I said this morning in uh, downstairs that it has become part of our DNA in Vermont and it's people love it and we are the ones who are responsible for administering the law, the Natural Resources Board. It's, it's a permit system to address the impacts of large development and on, on the environment and local government services. As you probably know, there are 10 criteria, but actually there are 32 because they're sub-criteria, just FYI. And the original vision was compact de development surrounded by open lands. So here we are in 2024 talking about compact development and open rural lands and working lands. So, uh, but we do have current issues, as you know, which is we lack affordable housing and we need to probably beef up uh, some protections on our rural and working lands. So that's, that's the... <coughs> I feel like I'm telling because you guys wrote, wrote this last year, sorry. But we're, so our, um, our report is, the topics include location-based jurisdiction, uh, the capability and development plan, and then what I'm calling uh, operations of the NRB, which includes fees, governance, staffing, that, all of those things, and we'll get into, we'll touch on that as well. Okay. Um, we had uh, the, the goal of this report was to provide you with uh, sets of recommendations that are con that were based on consensus from our stakeholder group, and so what you're what we're presenting to you today is our recommendations that were agreed to by a pretty diverse group of um, people who participated in the study. We had a 16 member steering committee. Two of our members are here, John Groveman from VNRC and Megan Sullivan from the Vermont Chamber. Uh, Pete and I were on it and others as well, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. We met probably 15, 20 times over the summer, and then the steering committee members also reached out to their uh, like-minded, uh, I mean, colleagues is the word I want to use, colleagues in their areas, and they set up focus group discussions as well so that the environmental uh, and working lands folks had one focus group and, uh, and attorneys had another, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, all that was because we're at room capacity. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and we were led by a facilitation t team of uh, five people, maybe six, I'm mean, going to count right away. Right. But thanks, thanks to, to the legislature, we had a, um, we, we were given an appropriation to pay them. Led by Matt Strasburg of the Environmental Mediation Center right here in Montpelier. Your former colleague, Maxine Grad. Yeah, Toby Berkman from um, Consensus Building Institute, which is uh, based in Boston, but he's working a lot with Vermont on agricultural issues. Uh, Tom Daniels, who was born and raised here in Vermont and is now a professor of inland use law and down in UPenn. Um, and then Jack Cartes, um, who's on the EMC board and has also got, I think, a PhD in land use planning. So it was a great, it was a great team. Um, and they managed the meetings, they led the, they led the process, they wrote the report. Um, so, and then our stakeholder groups, which are also the focus groups, included environmental and, uh, attorneys, engineers and consultants, planners, municipalities, housing, economic development, and environmental justice representation from the state office, environmental groups, working land operators, and our district coordinators, we were, were represented, as well as our district commissions. Any questions or comments before I pass the baton? No? Okay, cool. All right, Pete, Pete Gill, uh, Executive <laughs> Director. I'll get into a little of the meat of the study and some of the um, uh, recommendations uh, that were made by the steering committee. Um, so the first first off is jurisdiction, this idea of uh, location-based uh, jurisdiction um, came from this committee, I think, originally. Um, and uh, that um, the idea there is that you have um, uh, the um, triggers for Act 250 are based on uh, the um, 
area that you're in, the character of that area, and we and the steering committee came up with three different areas um, that uh, would be uh, used um, for that uh, location-based jurisdiction. And I'll get into each of those uh, three areas in a moment here. Um, it's important to note uh, just kind of that last bullet there about uh, the fact that this is really integral uh, to have that mapping element and the uh, uh, planning and the designation studies to really uh, build out what these, uh, what we call tiers of jurisdiction um, are uh, the, the, um, the basis for those. Um, it's, it's really, uh, you know, the foundation of, of that is, is based on um, the, uh, the mapping uh, and the designation study. All right, so the first, uh, first tier or area uh, is this, this idea of these planned growth areas. So we've got a, a tier 1A and a tier 1B, and I'll start with tier 1A. Um, these areas, you're, you're going to be thinking of areas that have water and sewer infrastructure. They've got uh, permanent subdivision and zoning regulations that, that are of high quality, meet certain standards. Um, and then uh, they've got the municipal capacity to administer um, those uh, effectively. Um, and the result of that in those particular areas, uh, there would be the commercial, residential, and industrial development would be outside of Act 250 review, so it would be exempt from Act 250, those situations. So moving on to the next uh, sub-tier here, Tier 1. Uh, this is village centers with capacity to accommodate growth. Um, so again, they would have zoning and subdivision regulations. Um, they would have sewer and water, um, or they have uh, the soils that would have capacity um, to handle the wastewater. And uh, their regulations and infrastructure administrative capacity is not quite that of those uh, Tier 1A um, areas. Um, those, in terms of uh, how the jurisdiction would be affected in those areas, um, it would be relatively, it would be the same as what we have now in terms of jurisdiction, but it would increase the residential units from 10 to 50 uh, residential units that were, would be allowed before Act 50 uh, would be, uh, jurisdiction would apply. And when I say Act 50 jurisdiction, I think we all know, but that just would mean that you're required to get a permit in those situations. Along here. So the next major tier is Tier 2. Um, these are these undeveloped and working lands um, areas, uh, small villages, hamlets, and all the land that's not in Tier 1 uh, or 3. Um, and how it would apply, how jurisdiction would apply in those particular areas um, under the recommendation of the steering committee uh, was that the jurisdictional triggers that exist now would not change uh, for Act 250, but for the addition of uh, an important um, uh, addition here for forest fragmentation, um, which would be this, this idea of, of um, roadways that are supporting development and subdivisions that are greater than 2,000 feet would uh, trigger Act 250 jurisdiction in those, those instances. Representative Smith. Thank you. Is that 2,000 foot uh, uh, roadway effective right now, or is that something you're thinking about? No, this is all recommendations from the steering committee in the, in the study. So that is not effective now. We do not have uh, a road uh, jurisdictional trigger so at the moment. Essentially, if someone had owned 100 acres and they wanted to build a house right in the middle of it, probably going to involve more than 2,000 feet of driveway, wouldn't you think? It would depend on the facts, yeah. That, so that particular... would require a permit to then, an Act 250 review? Yeah, the concept here would be that if it is 2,000 or greater, it would, um, it would require an Act 250 permit for that. Okay, what kind of steps would someone have to go through? I mean, is it a process that's going to be a, a six-month process or some, a permit that can be done in a couple of weeks? Uh, Permitting does take some time. Um, it does vary depending on the on the project. Um, yeah, but um, it's anywhere from two to six months, somewhere in that range. And we have, I think we've talked about it in this committee before, but we have different processes, a minor review process and a major review process. Mm -hmm. So if something goes through a major review, that's where there's a hearing. Obviously, those take longer <coughs> than the minor review process. But I will say that 
the vast majority of our projects do go through the minor review process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on from that one. Uh, moving along to tier three areas. Um, so by elimination, this is all that's that's not um, <laughs> tier one and tier tier two. Um, and these are these are areas that were that would the idea here is to set aside these um, these particular areas that are um, important natural resources areas. Um, and I should step back to for a minute here on, on this um, tier in particular, but the idea in terms of process, in terms of designating these um, areas, is to have um, a system by way that the municipality and the regional planning commissions have a voice in that. So on tier three, we'd start with the regional um, planning commission. They would have some consultation with the municipalities. Um, and then bring that up to a uh, state level board that would be approving uh, those designations. Um, with the tier one areas, those would be, yeah, I can. That be in conjunction with the future land use maps? So what you're, yes. that, that would be through that process? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Definitely integration again, that, that's very important. We're trying to outline and build the framework for what that would look like here in this, and then um, needing to have that integration from those other, other studies is important. Um, let's see, so the, the tier one in terms of process, very similar uh, to tier three, but it would kind of start with the municipality and then go to the uh, regional planning commission for review and make sure it's consistent with the regional uh, plan in that area, and then again, go up to the uh, a state board for, for review. Um, so uh, getting back to tier three here in these, these particular areas, um, it would be you know, science-based driven, making sure that, um, uh, that the protections uh, are needed in those particular areas, um, and, uh, and it would rely on that mapping, making sure that the, um, uh, that would help inform, inform that. Um, and then jurisdictional rule here would be the idea that, that it attaches like our existing 2,500 feet of elevation, um, where if you've got a development or subdivision in that, in that uh, tier, uh, you would trigger Active 50 and you'd have a review. You'd have a review. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, uh, How much in terms of process is this really, is tier three different from the current status, meaning if we know something is a really um, precious natural resource area, it doesn't it kind of already go into automatic Act 250 review? No. We, no, we don't. We don't have those types of triggers right now. Um, yeah, there are some parallels with the location-based jurisdiction, like the 2,500 feet, but um, that's not really the concept that we have in Act 50 currently. Okay. Let's see, Representative Sevilla. Thanks for your testimony and all your work on this. I know you worked summer and fall. The last, uh, and, and, and prior to that, um, I, I just want to check in on the last bit, um, Peter, around the uh, 2,500. Yep. Did you say if you have a development there now, we would retroactively trigger? No, sorry. Um, currently, under under the statute as it exists now, there is a trigger for development yeah. above 2,500 yeah. feet. So that's not new. So you were just stating existing. Right. Yes, exactly. Okay. Just as a parallel. No, to I, kind of I knew that that existed. Yeah. I thought you were saying there was something new about it, like no. retroactive or something no. like that. OK. Yeah. No, thank you. Representative Smith. Thank you. And that 2,500 feet is not no not changing that's yeah that no because so I, I'd heard rumors that uh, pro probably just rumors that there was going to be reduced to 2,000 feet or something along that line there was a uh, discussion about that during the steering committees no um, but there was not consensus so that's a good point here um, we are representing the um, views of the steering committee in this and this report and the recommendations that were part of a consensus that was built between the various um, members of that steering committee that Sabina outlined, um, and and um, you know, in that consensus, it wasn't that everybody loved everything that was in there. It was a matter of with this group that we can we can live with this as it as it's structured that way. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, 
I'll move on to the next one here. Um, so we kind of went over this already the, in terms of the process, um, but just so you have it visually there, um, a regional planning commission for tier, tier three, again, because a lot of these uh, particular important uh, resources may go beyond one municipality, and so this idea of these are more regional and, and having that regional view um, was important. Uh, for the steering committee in terms of the process for designating these uh, tier three, but again, very science-based um, approach uh, to designating those uh, particular resources. It's a bottoms up approach that would get approved by a state board, which is something I think <coughs> Vermonters like to see. Yeah. Representative Spelia then so. <coughs> so I would agree that it has the potential to be a bottoms up. Um, you know, I think we have some work to do. We had the regional planning commissions in this morning. Um, you know, our town's ability to participate with the regional planning commissions, how kind of how much inflow is coming locally as opposed to state um, into our RPCs is something. You know, I'm hoping that we're going to talk about with these kind of very significant changes that we're looking at across the entire state. Um, I think that capacity um, and ensuring that, in fact, we have bottoms up is important. Uh, state board review, do you mean NRB review or a new different state board? That was not decided, but I think that um, I think that the general idea is that it would probably be the NRB. but. It was not. It was not decided per se. And so it's written like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was intentional. Yeah. We'll let that up to to you all. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So the next slide here is just a, a, an overview or visual for those that uh, learn that way best. Um, of what we just discussed in terms of the various tiers um, also may be a helpful resource as you're conceptualizing this or thinking about it um, going forward. Okay. Yeah, do you want me to go back to that slide? Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, important natural resource areas, and I know we did some work around this last year on the 30 by 30. and. Is it possible that my uh, property that I own and that I have a home on, that that could be designated an important natural resource area? It will all come down to the mapping and, and um, those locations. And there again, there's a process for determining that. And um, and how would, how would I know that that was happening? and what would be the opportunities for me to engage in the proposal that you're bringing forward? I think community engagement and uh, in the process is yeah. an important uh, aspect of, of this. Um, again, this is very broad framework of how we look at this, and there's gonna be some of that, not to turn it all on, on you all, but that will need to be fleshed out for okay. sure. So I'm hearing you say community engagement is Important public feedback and public yeah. input, input yes. not recommendations that you're bringing to us. That's our work. Right. Yeah. So yeah. just to orient the group, there's the all of the things we're looking at today, the off session work that's happened, kind of is a nested group of studies that fit together, and we're going to fit them together, and they've coordinated among themselves to a very remarkable degree. Mm -hmm considering the amount of time uh, and people involved. And um, so this is just like our first orientation to where the summer reports have come back to us on. So I, I guess I'd ask for a little bit of patience and just sort of let this wash over us, uh, absorb it, and we'll have plenty of opportunity to discuss individual reports that we need to, and then also to get into um, bills that have been introduced. So. Representative Bongarts and I worked and communicated with all of these groups all summer long and have set up a framework in a bill that's been introduced um, that is seeking to respect all of this work that's happened and integrate it into that larger framework that will provide the structure we need to have the conversations at a deeper level. 
So with that, if you still have a question for these witnesses, I do. okay, Representative Smith, and then thank, thank you, Clifford. Thank you. Uh, going back to what uh, Representative Smith was saying, say she's a recluse and she's got this property, and she doesn't get the community information that she wants. Uh, can you change her property and have it a, a, with a different description with her not knowing it? Do you know, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, and, and that's not actually a, a, a very, um, this isn't really the group to ask that question. To. Okay. So this is, uh, again, I think that goes to the more detailed conversation that we'll have later on when we get into that. Okay, okay, that's so, fine. Thanks for Thank holding you. on to that. Thank you. I'll try to remember. <laughs> so this is the Natural Resources Board who currently administers Act 250, and they're reporting back to us on their off-session stakeholder group. Representative Clifford. You get out of that one. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, just a question on the exempt from Act 250, no change lots and units road rule. Does that affect the three-acre rule at all? That's a storm uh, uh, operation. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's separate. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's an A&R um, permitting. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so there's your there's your overview um, to keep in mind there um, in terms of jurisdictional framework. On uh, that one um, last area, and I think I pass it over to Sabina here next, um, is there was discussion in the steering committee as well on the forest fragmentation criterion. Um, we currently have a 9C for forest soils. Um, and there was discussion about <coughs> needing to have um, a, a revised 9C that would really look at site design, clustering, development, um, living in disturbed areas. To um, So this, again, these are criteria. So once you're in Act 250 and you're getting reviewed, this is um, what would apply in terms of looking at uh, the protection of the forest within that um, property. So in places where we would now have automatic Act 250, this would automatically come into play. This would be one of the criteria that would be reviewed, correct? So not jurisdiction. It's the, this is criteria to review. Once you're, if you yeah, are if there's it, jurisdiction, this would apply. Yes. So my property that may now be in automatic Act 250 jurisdiction may also now be subject I'm not to sure course. where you're headed with this exactly. How is your property in automatic? Do you, do you have an Act 250 permit uh, in your property? No, no, no. no, I'm asking if it's uh, as my question before. Okay, it's so about it being it, a, a natural resource area. It uh, deemed a natural resource area. It'd be a tier three. Yeah, one if it's deemed protected. tier three. Right. 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 And then it would um, potentially. Yeah. Well, your home would still be allowed, if you will, because it's there. But if you wanted to build a car dealership or something, you, it, it would be probably not okay. Or like my kid wanted to build a house there. That'll, that'll right, right. And whether it's car dealership or house, what tier three is saying is that it would jurisdiction would apply, and so review would happen in that, and you would need to meet the criteria. One of which uh, is recommended by the steering committee to change, which is as far as fragmentation, so that that would be reviewed as well. Thank you. But it wouldn't mean it wouldn't be able to do right. those um, that development necessarily. It would be that it would be reviewed under the Active 50 program. Right. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina on okay. but, governance. Um, before I start in on that part, I um, wanted to thank you for recognizing the amount of collaboration that went on with all the different studies this summer. And we really, we really approach you and the rest of the legislature as this is a framework and that the three are, should be nested, to use your word, Chair Sheldon, and that it builds the, the, the next steps and the framework. And I'm very hopeful that we will that you all will see that the framework is a good idea. And then <clears throat> as we need to implement the different tiers or whatever we end up calling it and the mapping and that type of thing, that maybe the framework goes in to, to statute this year and then we get 18 months to two years to implement, if you will, and move forward from there. The, you know, the different agencies, the different state partners. 
Um, and we were at a uh, Vermont Planners Association meeting last month, and there was there was a lot of strong positive feedback on this, and a lot of hope. I think is the best way to put it. Um, it was nice. It was really nice. And um, before I move on, I would wanted to give our two steering committee members a chance to, if they wanted to add anything and if they thought it misrepresented anything. Hey. <laughs> you don't have to talk if you don't want to. I just want to give you the, I'm just trying to be inclusive. Do you want to finish your presentation and finish with the recommendations? I can do that and then let, and let have them give an opportunity then? Okay. Sorry, I'm too quiet right now, sorry. <laughs> so uh, another area of the study was about what I'm calling operations, which takes into account governance, staffing, fees, et cetera. Um, it was universal. I don't think anybody disagreed that we need to go to a professional board. It was, uh, now there was not a total agreement on whether it should be a three-person board or a five-person board. But that, uh, that the types of, Changes and things that we that want that are being discussed, um, they deserve people who are, have more time commitment and have the and have a professional background that makes it easier to you know assume, get get into it and dig into it, the knowledge and everything. So that was uh, one uh, one of the recommendations, and we did not land on whether it should be a three-person board or a five-person board with a full-time chair, by the way. <clears throat> that they should be the, besides the full-time chair, the others would be part-time. Um, and that, you know, that's what, what that means if it's, I used in the report, we use the PUC model, and they're paid at a two-thirds, but sometimes they work less and sometimes they work more, but they base the salary and the benefits on a two-thirds position, just, just FYI. Um, they'll be needed to manage the new tiers process if that happens, the mapping, etc. And it'll also bring to the board, to the organization, a level of uh, rule making and policy guidance and direction and oversight of the district offices and staff and commissions as needed. Um, it brings, you know that one of the most popular anecdotal complaints about Act 250 is it's not consistent, it's not predictable, and it takes too long. We see a professional board as being able to help on all three of those. Okay. Um, we did not reach consensus on whether they should hear appeals or not. We did not reach consensus on whether they should hear majors or not. Um, I know that there's a strong interest in having the board be renamed and, and hearing appeals. Um, I would respectfully ask that that would happen after we stand up the board and get the tiers and get the mapping in place and then start thinking about it because it's a lot to do in a couple of years and we had we had 13 um appeals last year which is out of 400 cases is not very many so it's it's not a huge pressing issue to my point um, but that's why I'm, yeah uh staffing you all asked us to look at that. We are uh, on the books, a 25-person organization, but in, we have three additional positions with the ARPA funds, two uh, coordinators who um, support both the North Districts and the South Districts, and then Pete's position. We would uh, ask that those positions be made permanent. Uh, it'll also help with timeliness, and again, with this new tier, if, there's, if, if it's adopted, the tiers and reviewing maps and being part of that whole process, that, that there'll be additional responsibilities. I'll also point out that since the um, permit specialist, uh, the permit navigator system came, on, came online uh, five years ago now, we went from 17 jurisdictional opinions to 230 this year. What is that, 200, oh, you know what I mean. It's more than 100%. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, so you're linking an increase in jurisdictional opinions with the online tool? I am, because at the end of the day, and we'll get into this in a, in a second, at the end of the day, people want to talk to people, 
when they have questions about Act 250. And it's a complicated law. And they, they'll go through the permit navigator system, you know, do what they need to do, because then they're like, oh, I should really talk to somebody about X or Y. And we are seeing people want more and more pre-application meetings and pre-hearing meetings. It just helps people get through the process. I mean, we're think of something complicated in your personal life and you want to talk to somebody, you don't want to have to do it all online and see if you're not doing it. You just want to be able to pick up the phone occasionally. I'm sorry, I must be misunderstanding you. I thought you said you stood up the online tool and you got more questions. The, the permit navigator is part of ANR, and now we and now we we handle all these jurisdictional opinions. Maybe P is in a better position to so, be able to. Yeah, I can jump in yeah. really, really quick. So, um, and I wasn't here for the transition period, but my understanding of it all is, is so there was a permit specialist at the Agency of Natural Resources, which would help, uh, they would start a PRS project review sheet looking for whether jurisdiction applies to a number of different programs in our programs as well as Act 250. Um, so uh, they would do a lot of preliminary work outreach with the individual that was seeking the permits or that had the project in mind. Um, and, and they would get, build up the, what the um, development was, was to be and get an, an understanding of it and then pass that along with all that information to our staff to be able to get um, that uh, the jurisdictional opinion done and uh, figured out. And with the permit navigator, that replaced a number of those positions uh, for uh, permit specialists. And so now um, folks are going through this online version and uh, just you know checking boxes and not necessarily uh, probably understandably so, checking the box, okay, jurisdictional opinion on this or, or that, and we are receiving many more of those, but it's requiring a lot of effort on our district coordinators to gather that information because that's not happening at the agency level. It's now happening at our level. And so we are then in the direct seat to be uh, providing our services for jurisdictional opinions, which I think is a really good thing. Um, as I was saying, I mean, just being able to allow that interaction between between folks, I think that's really, really positive. Um, but it has increased our number of jurisdictional opinions uh, that we've had to issue uh, substantially. Of those, how many were brought into Act, under Act 250 versus said you don't need to apply for an Act 250? Oh, I don't have those statistics, yeah. but it's something we can, yeah. we can look up for you for sure. I should have had that ready. <clears throat> Um, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. I um, just want to get back to uh, positions that are being paid for by ARPA funds now. Mm -hmm. So now those are two positions? Uh, three altogether, two coordinators and Pete's position. So three, so. And they're funded through December 31st, 2025. Okay, okay. But the, okay, so that's not, uh, that's on top of, the 25 so we're 28 now right so that's so that's on top of the professional three to five members <coughs> that it's, that's proposed that's correct thank you well separate three to five members well, for the four. Think budgeting is that what you meant yeah yeah for overall personnel right it would be all of those combined thank you yeah. so yeah. nice. um thank you madam sir i i can understand the rationale that um you know, while you're transitioning through this, presumably, you know, depending on what evolves, right. if there is a tiered transition uh, approach, do you have any sense of how much work, like, would there be less work once you have a tiered system? Um, because there'd be exemptions? Uh, yeah, or just clearer, I don't, I don't, I suppose. I think that's debatable. Okay. Uh, because if there are exemptions, um, which we support, by the way, that they, there's going to have to be some level of, uh, my choice of words, compliance, making sure municipalities are able to do it. That's going to take some kind of role in our organization to make sure, that, to make sure that's happening. Um, uh, there will be, uh, we may be asked to, I, I can't even, I'm, I'm speculating now, but there'll be other things that'll come up with the 
with the mapping and the tiers and you know that part of it. Certainly, in the in the short term, um, and probably into the future. I mean, there will be uh, significant work in setting up all these um, projects and implementing it. Um, a new structure will require new guidance, etc. Mm -hmm. And do you have a sense of how long you think a new structure would take to get up and implement it? Well, at the, at the very back of the report, there are suggested timelines, but as uh, my colleagues in the back, uh, I think it was the, it may be, it should be with the, we were thinking of the July, July 1, 2026, um, end of the exemption with the Home Act, so that it would just kind of flow in. But I see that there's um, possibilities that, let, that there's legislation to extend that. But that, I mean, I think probably 18 to 24 months. And I, I, Maybe the mapping is going to take longer, Representative Bung. I mean, did you all hear about that? Yeah, we. I was talking. Let's about talk the about the timeline as we yeah. get into it. We have a timeline in the bill that we've proposed, and um, yeah, let's finish with this. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. So that's that's the questions about staffing. Um, I'll just I'll just move right into fees because mm -hmm. how's this. You brought up the point. How's this all going to get paid for? Um, if the if if the legislature moves forward with the exemptions, uh, we are now currently um, our revenues are derived eighty percent from fees and twenty percent from the general fund, um, and our total budget is three seven and change. I think next year it's three that we three nine is what I. Somewhere between three seven and three nine. I apologize, I'm forgetting right now. Um, we have calculated the exemptions in the Home Act to be about one hundred and twenty thousand three hundred dollars potentially. Very close. <laughs> Ninety six with the housing and the difference for coming from the utility exemptions as potential. So you, you can extrapolate from there that if there are further exemptions, there'll be fewer fees. So there'll need to be a, there'll need to be a, uh, some decisions made about that. And we're nine, and we're ninety percent. Ninety percent of our costs are derived from personnel. We only have a ten percent operating budget. Which is our district offices and that type of thing. So we're running on we're we're lean we're lean and mean. Well, not we're not mean. We're lean, <laughs> lean and nice, lean and helpful. Yes. Is that a Morris? Will there be recommendations or expectations of what that what those fees might generate? If we have more exemptions, less fees, will there be some sort of budgetary? Consideration. We um, just submitted our fee study to the JFO, so I'm, I'm guessing that we'll be back talking about that at some point. Thank you. But um, as a rule of thumb, 40 percent, 40 plus percent of our fees come from Chittenden County, but it's not 40 percent of our projects, although so there's some more expensive projects in that area. But you can see that that's fair, fairly significant amount. And yeah, I, it's just bad, bad time to come in here asking for a lot of money, right? <laughs> bad year. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Pete with the capability and development plan. <clears throat> Great. Um, so just two slides left. Uh, keep your attention there. Um, capability and development plan. Uh, so the steering committee recognized that the uh, previously developed maps uh, related to this um, really needed uh, updating. Um, uh, you know, done on uh, updated technology here. Um, you can see the examples uh, there. So 
like we said before, this is all really integrated with the future land use map um, process, and that would be essential to this um, uh, work here, I think. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of consensus recommendations, there was um, a lot of discussions on uh, working lands and one uh, area of consensus that did emerge was this idea of um, uh, allowing for a reduced agricultural soils mitigation ratio uh, for forest processing enterprises uh, to one-to-one. -one. Um, this is similar to uh, the industrial parks uh, right now and, uh, have that same uh, provision. Others, it's either two to one or, or uh, uh, three to one. Reverse that one to three, one to two, one to three. This depends on how you want to say it, but anyways. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, that's the end of the, the presentation? Yeah, okay. Uh, I just want to say one more time, I appreciate your work and I really appreciate yeah, our regular meetings um, in the off session. And I believe you also met with Representative Bongarts regularly to keep us in the loop and following your work. So thank you for that. And you gave a shout out to your other um, steering committee members who are here. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to say something right now, you can, or um, there will likely be another chance for you to come back. Do you want to add anything? Megan, go first. If you just yeah, are you really prepared to say anything specific, Megan Sullivan, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vermont Chamber of Commerce, I appreciate the opportunity to be on this committee uh, and have these discussions. Um, these are incredibly important issues. Um, certainly, housing crisis is something that we constantly are hearing about from our members. Um, you know, and I think we've all seen the of climate change and impact on our natural resources, and and we. Uh, Changes to Act 250 um, can work on in both of these fronts um, and not be in conflict with each other, but be in concert as we find compromise to move forward. I think this was an incredible opportunity for organizations like the Vermont Chamber and VNRC and planners to sit down in a room together and really find our common ground um, and find those, those compromises. And so what you see before you is a, a package um, that was not anything easily arrived at, nothing that, you know, anybody um, sort of flippantly said, sure, 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 whatever. We all, you know, put a lot of time and effort into to make, uh, to understand where each organization was coming from and, and um, priorities um, to, to come to this. And there's still a lot of details to be worked out, but appreciate the process and appreciate um, the, the time that you're all going to want to give this and to give opportunities for um, the evolution of 250. Thank you. John, did you want to add any? Yeah, just, just from a, from a 30,000 foot point of view, John Grobman, Policy and Water Program Director for Vermont Natural Resources Council. So I think as you go through the bill, the specific bills that the chair, I think wisely said, let this wash over you because you're going to have specific bills with provisions to review. I, you know, we came here last year, we, we definitely have a significant housing issue in the state. We have a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis. We're dealing with many serious issues in Vermont, all over the country. What we said, our plea was last year, don't take drastic action that would gut Act 250, you know, a law that served us so well. Let this study go forward and let this work go forward. And as Megan said, with planners and stakeholders from different perspectives, and let us come back to you with some ideas for how to go forward in a rational, reasoned way to both alter Act 250 to address where we need housing, um, but also protect critical natural resources. And so I think that there's a lot in this the report does a good job of creating that rational approach. Um, you know, I, I've just scanned some of the bills that are out there. I, I think, you know, some of the bills I've seen don't take a rational approach. It goes back to, well, let's just open up Act 250 sort of everywhere doesn't have the balancing part of really protecting critical habitat and natural resources and headwaters and wetlands and other resources that we need to protect. And I think what this report represents is a way to kind of go forward and, and do both of those things. So I encourage you to read the report and, and, and then compare it to the bills you have. And, and I would urge you to keep that in mind. 
That was Representative Sebelia was here, but for both Representative Smith and Representative Smith, just as we go through this process, hearing your concerns, you know, the recommendation for dealing with these critical resources through year three, you know, the, the whole idea was not to basically, there'd be plenty of notice before property was designated as a critical resource area. This would be the state board would be created. There would have to be an application. There would be a review process. There would be notice. There would be an opportunity to come before the board. So, mm -hmm. so I just read the report and drill into it because that's certainly the case. There's certainly not, there's, not, there's no, it was never the intent that you, and I don't, I don't, I think it would be illegal, quite frankly, to, <laughs> to, to, to just to, to adopt these sort of restrictions without any due process notice. So, and similarly, things like the road rule, and we've been grappling for years, how do we protect critical habitat and resources? And we've been around the block and, you know, trying to figure out ways to do it. And, you know, so the road rule in the report is one way to do it. And you have debated that issue before, you'll debate it again. Mm -hmm. Um, but we need to do something. We need to have a balanced approach. And that's that's basically, I think, what the report is giving you. And it had a lot of stakeholders from divergent point of view. <laughs> With expert planners, like you heard this morning, I thought the presentation this morning was excellent. And that is the exciting part of the work because it's rational, right? It's let's do this in a plan with, with expert planners to, to an, analyze where we want to grow, what do we need to protect, and, and how do we do that? So I'm excited and scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's what Representative Bongard says. <laughs> We're going to do do the planning before we this before before and then after the fact, rather than after the fact, right? Isn't that what you said? Yeah, that's what I said. Okay, I say something. It's not, it's a rather the discussion here. I think the other thing that all of this does when it's all put together, especially the future land use maps, and if you look at it this morning is that it really shifts us from very often using the regulatory process for after the fact planning to doing the planning up front, having a regulatory process actually be relatively already you know, a much lesser part of, of the process because we've made those, those hard decisions first, not just on the basis of the permit application. And that's where all of this has the chance to really make the whole thing work much more smoothly for everybody. So it's just one part of what we have the possibility of coming out of this process if we get it right. Yeah, great. Thank you again for your presentation and your off session work. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. We're happy to come back. Yes. Great. <laughs> See you Friday. See you Friday. Perhaps the last note. Just to be clear, too. Uh, we are still live. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hang on, hang on. I'm sorry. Still live. We have not adjourned. And we can adjourn, but I want to make sure that members have a chance before we do that. If there's anything you want to ask or say um, on the tape before we do. Okay, lots to say, obviously, to individuals off. <laughs>